Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldEldar.com. I'm Brent, and this is the unit focus video on Dark Reapers. If you follow the global meta at all, that is if you get online and you look at tournament results and you see which lists did well and which GTs or opens, and it's fine if you don't, most players don't. But if you do do this and you do it with special emphasis on looking up how craft worlds did, because presumably if you're watching this video, you are a craft worlds enthusiast, you have noticed a couple of things. One thing you have noticed, no doubt, with some chagrin, is that there aren't a whole lot of pure craft worlds lists really burning things up in ninth edition high level competitive play. It, it, they, they almost never make it into the last eight of any of the, the major tournaments. Uh, it's pretty rare indeed. But, but what we have been seeing a fair amount of, right, and another thing you might have noticed, is that Craft World's detachments in Aldari soup lists have had some presence, and they've actually quite recently had more of a presence. And these Craft World's detachments appearing in these Aldari soup lists are <coughs> most commonly uh, heavy support oriented, right? So for obvious reasons, I think, right? If you're running Harlequins, Harlequins excel at grabbing objectives, at close combat, they're very aggressive, but what they don't have a lot of is long range heavy fire support. And that's something that Craft Worlds is pretty good at. So that's that's uh, that's an obvious synergy. And similarly, uh, in, a, in a fusion list with Drakari, if, if you were to run both, probably you'd be leaning into Craft Worlds heavy support. And so Dark Reapers, not only uh, have Dark Reapers had a, a, a presence right in, in the world of competitive craft worlds play at, at the highest levels, really since the beginning of ninth, ninth edition to some degree. Recently, they might be the unit that is, uh, other than the Farseer, that most commonly appears in these well-performing craft worlds lists. And, and typically it is one very particular configuration, which... I will talk about in this video one one particular build there's a reason why msu so three elf reaper units with the exarch power rapid shot and a reaper launcher in the delicate fingers of the exarch currently seems to be the the, the preferred build uh it has to do with what's going on with admech and death guard in particular maybe some other factions too but essentially msu reaper units with the right sub faction bonuses and exarch powers are a powerful counter to some of the most meta dominant factions in the game right now and they're also just good uh i i think in fact that dark reapers might be one of two units maybe three units if, if you include well if you leave our psychic powers out, maybe two units that even factions that have ninth edition codexes could could legitimately be jealous of. They could be, well, wouldn't it be great if we if we had something like that? Dark, Dark Reapers are probably first equal best infantry heavy support unit in the game. Somebody in the comments is going to get upset and say, "No, I can come up with two that are, are better," and maybe you can't. But they're but they're re they're really good. They're definitely one of the best uh, heavy support infantry units in the game, hands down. Even at thirty two points a model. They're really good. So what we're going to do in this video, uh, we're going to talk about that that build that I already mentioned that's burning things up and why it's burning things up and why it's good and why maybe it's something you, you, you'd you like to play around with. We will we will compare it to the a, a more traditional large block Dark Reaper build that you can buff. And since the uh, FAQ early this year, you, you know, that block can also fire and fade into a vehicle. Uh, which is pretty cool. We'll, we'll compare the two. We'll talk about their, their relative strengths and, and liabilities and how to mitigate those liabilities. And we will talk about, let's see, I'll, I'll go through all the Exarch powers, the possible loadouts. I'll start with those things. And hopefully uh, those of you who, who maybe own Reapers, but you haven't had a lot of luck with them on the table, uh, can get some more confidence about using that unit effectively because I think regardless of what of what your meta there are definitely metas in which it's harder to use reapers but regardless of what your meta is like this unit should have some play for you and then those of you who don't own reapers maybe I can convince you to add them to your collection I really think that even if even if craft worlds are not your main army it makes sense to own some reapers they really they can do some real work for you and and those veteran players who sign on to these videos 50% to be entertained while they paint 50% to see if I make mistakes uh which is fine, you know, we're, we're, we're only human. So um, 
I hopefully you will there will be something here that you can take away that maybe maybe you're not all, already doing uh, maybe so here we go the 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 standard Reaper weapon the the the, the Reaper launcher has two different profiles and one the well, the first reason that Reapers are such a fantastic tool to have in your arsenal is that the the two profiles are not the standard like two have usually heavy weapons that have two profiles have an anti-infantry profile and then they have an anti-hard target profile and that's cool so think a little bit like the aml right d6 or like anti-infantry or one targeting a tank or something uh but not so with reapers reapers have two different heavy profiles both of which excel at targeting different types of uh, hard target. So there's an anti-heavy infantry and biker profile, right, which is heavy 2, strength 5, minus 2 AP, flat 2 damage, 48 inch range. That's the Star Swarm missile. For, by the way, 48 inches, especially in 9th edition with a slightly smaller table, fan-freaking-tastic, right? Pretty much anything they can see, they can tag, and they can do it while being far, away en uh, far enough away from enemy units that potentially, at least against some factions, your, your opponent just won't be able to return fire, will not have an easy time getting into range, which is huge. So that uh, flat two damage, I've already talked elsewhere on the blog and on the, the channel about why flat two is so good. You know, if you're running two wound heavy infantry or two wound bikes, every failed save is a dead model. And usually two wound models are reasonably expensive. Not always, right? Uh, Marines are, are pretty cheap for two wounds. But uh, nevertheless, it's a really efficient way to eliminate units with two wounds and at strength five it wounds pretty much anything it wants to target on a three plus right and so if you say you're running in your list we'll, we'll just make it easy and say you know you're you are you have a unit of of 10 reapers and it's just a big block right reapers can be in units of three to ten with one exarch model and even leaving aside rapid shot or or other trickiness if you were just unloading with you know 20 of these projectiles that always hit on threes fun thing about reapers they ignore all modifiers both positive and negative by the way they always hit on threes regardless uh and then at strength five they're probably wounding whatever you're targeting on threes minus two is pretty good ap and then every failed save is a dead model and then of course there are ways to buff them if you have an autark or you cast guide on them if, if they're a single unit uh if they're if you have masterful shots, right, then potentially they ignore cover, which they're already ignoring penalties to hit, but now we're also ignoring benefits to armor save. That can be pretty devastating. There's there's not, there aren't a lot of uh, flat or models with two wounds in the game that that want to be targeted in that way. I mean, it's it's devastating, right? So ob it's just obviously good. And then the the other profile is heavy one, strength eight, also minus two AP, curiously, but then flat three damage. And one of the reasons that Reapers have been on the rise, and I think in the last few months, is that this flexibility, right? So they have these two profiles, but instead of being anti-hard target, anti-light infantry, they have anti-heavy infantry, and then they have anti very heavy infantry slash bikes slash they can also mess up tanks and monsters pretty effectively uh that other missile profile that flat three damage missile that is absolutely brutal and since psychic awakening there's a way to significantly increase the output of an msu dark reaper squad which pre-psychic awakening would fire three shots right but post psychic awakening they're essentially firing five shots we'll talk about why shortly uh but the ability to do, to do flat three damage now not only can you take out stuff like terminators uh with each failed save eliminates a, a, a terminator uh or really puts the hurt on an enemy tank uh, it's a lighter tank like a flyer like a t7 flyer uh can be eliminated with one volley from a, an MSU unit of Dark Reapers. But best of all, uh, currently, in the current meta, I think, stuff like Death Guard, right, where they, there's a, Death Guard have disgusting resilience and the, their, the rules for that changed and initially everybody was up in arms, it's bad now, and then it turns out that it's better than it was before, it's excellent. Uh, what disgusting resilience does, if you don't play a lot of Death Guard players, and if, wow, wouldn't, wouldn't that be cool to, to play in a meta where there were not a ton of Death Guard players? But uh, 
Death Guard's just really good right now. So Disgusting Resilience reduces incoming damage by one. And and for for marine models or terminate so normally to to eliminate um uh you know a, a terminator, right, with three wounds. Uh if it were a, a regular marine terminator and it had and it had three wounds, every failed save kills a model. But but Death Guard have this ability to shrug damage. So the ability to do flat three means anything that has two wounds will now you're still killing it. Still, every failed stave is a dead model. And if you do come up against something with uh, three or or even four wounds, then it's every two saves kills the thing. And and that's and that's pretty good too. So uh, reapers are just an enormously efficient way to eliminate heavy infantry, bikes, death guard stuff. And my goodness, does Admac have a ton of two wound infantry right now? One of the the, the scariest builds i think the scariest builds to come up against is these sort of like ad mech hordy lists where they're if you're a craft worlds player it's particularly frustrating because they're they they're faster than we are which is so bad for us if something's faster than we are uh because they can start a bunch of models in the middle of the table and then make a pregame move with all of them and then they have all these movement shenanigans so they're faster than we are they're harder hitting than we are they're tougher than we are um and it can it can feel hopeless, but uh, that flat two damage missile profile on a bunch of MSU Reapers that are that are potentially taking extra shots is just nasty against uh, those admech to woundy hordy lists. There's a, a a guy in my local meta who's a fabulous player who was running that, and then I think I think. Richard Siegler ran, like came up with a similar list, and he was like, "Haha, I, I beat him to it. Uh, it." It's it's brutal to play against, and I think the reason we're seeing so many Reapers right now doing well in GTs is they just are a great counter to the stuff that's that's dominating the game right now. Okay, so we've talked about the the, the profile for the Reaper launcher. It is it is worth acknowledging that when you put together a Reaper squad, you although all the all the regular Reapers are going to take the the Reaper launcher, your Exarch has options, uh, but fewer than the Codex says, because in theory, your Exarch has four options. You could take a Reaper launcher, a Tempest launcher, a Shuriken cannon, or an Aldari missile launcher. But let's be honest, why would you give your Dark Reaper Exarch a Shuriken cannon? I guess maybe because they made the current Reaper sculpts back in some other edition where the Surikin cannon was a thing that was good and it's still on the sprue and there's just no reason you would ever you would ever do it. It it only has a 24 inch range. It doesn't have any reliable AP. Uh it's 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 baffling that it's even an option. Um the the Eldari missile launcher so you could swap the the Reaper launcher out for the Eldari missile launcher and this might for a hot second seem potentially tempting because with the Exarch power rapid shot, uh, which I have already mentioned, which allows your Exarch to fire his weapon an extra time. So an extra time, not not a totally new attack. So if you fired with the Tempest Launcher once, you can't rapid shot and then fire 2d6 shots again with the Tempest Launcher. No, it's just, it's an additional attack die with with whatever it is but you might be thinking to yourself uh if you are a, a newish craft worlds player well i'll give him the eldari missile i'll pay the 20 points i will give him the eldari missile launcher and when i use that strength 8 aml profile uh with it does d6 damage instead of flat three damage he will be firing twice aha it will be like having 40 points of heavy weapons instead of 20 points of heavy weapons and while you are right about math it's just not a great idea and and the reason is if you think about the stuff that you want to target for one thing why that why would you spend 20 points on on that the, these models are already way too expensive uh to, well not really i mean I, I think they could be a little cheaper to be fair compared to what uh some of the other factions that have ninth edition codexes are, are fielding and all of that will get sorted out when we have a codex of our own but they're really they're still a good deal at, at 32 points so maybe they don't need to be but um 20 points is a lot to pay for a weapon that takes you from essentially flat three damage to d6 damage yes it has it has another profile option but so does the reaper launcher and and it's it's a particularly bad idea in this situation because of target priority so your reapers want to shoot heavy infantry and bikes 
most of the time. And D6, not only does D6 not help with that, it's a liability, right? Because if I shoot a three wound model with a missile that does three damage, unless it has a, a feel no pain, I just kill it. Whereas if I'm rolling D6, it, it essentially has a one out of three additional armor save to just shrug off the shot. So it's actually, for what you're using Reapers for, it's actually worse. Yes, are there situations in which if your Reapers are exclusively targeting vehicles and you're using rapid shot on the AML, it could, the math could turn out to be better? Yeah, but overall, right, unless, unless you're building a list to be a very specific list, and that's not the most fun way to play anyway, and also arguably not sporting in, in certain metas. Um, it's just, it's not a good pick. Build, don't, don't build your Exarc with the AML. Uh, the other option is the Tempest Launcher. Now, the Tempest Launcher is really good. There's, there's no doubt that this is a really good weapon. It's 2d6, uh, strength for minus 2 AP, which is cool, because the, the anti-infantry profile for the AML is only minus 1 AP. Flat 1 damage, and in addition... It can target units not visible to the bear. So it's it's an indirect fire weapon. 2d6. I mean, against against a horde unit, potentially you're rolling 12 dice. That's so good. It's so powerful. Uh Craft Worlds really excels at indirect fire. In fact, I, I think we're probably the most I think we have the best indirect fire in the game. Uh it hasn't that hasn't been enough to take us over the the finish line for, for ninth edition to be doing better in tournaments, but it but it is a big advantage. And the Tempest Launcher is a super useful tool against enemy infantry units sitting out of line of sight, maybe on some objective that's hard to get to. You know, you can prevent your opponent from scoring an objective. It's effective against uh, aggressive hordes of pox walkers, for example. Uh, I'm trying to think what other horde units are good right now. There are a bunch of them, or the new orcs, right? Like. Orcs are really up and coming, and and maybe as we see more and more orcs in the meta, the Tempest Launcher will start nudging out the, the Reaper Launcher again. Maybe. It's possible. It is good. It's very good. But I think that if you are, it has to do with what what, what the best build is, it has to do with the role that your Reapers are performing in your list, right? And so certainly in my meta right now, and I think in a lot of metas uh, where we're seeing a lot of Admech and Death Guard and a lot of... Um, a, 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 just a lot of units that are that are sitting solidly around two or three wounds. They're hard to shift. They're very aggressive. This is definitely going to be the, the the better pick, right? The the Reaper launcher with with the extra shots. And again, I'll go into detail about that build, so I won't get ahead of myself. But uh, if you don't have in your list other ways to deal with hordes, right? If if you have other stuff in your list that's that's taking out your your enemies' bikes or their terminators or whatever it is. Uh, then maybe the Tempest Launcher really is a better pick for you. 36 inch range is pretty good. It, 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 you do end up with this like weird tension between what the two, if, if it's an MSU unit, what the two Reapers want to shoot with their Reaper launchers versus what the Exarch is targeting, but it's fine. You, you split fire. You end up with like not quite enough reaper launcher fire to eliminate anything and the tempest launcher is on its own not probably quite enough to eliminate anything but if you have a few msu reaper units and they all have tempest launchers well now now you can really you can really do some damage and you have some more reliable target elimination so the tempest launcher is particularly a good pick or it is potentially a good pick i i will say uh i don't think i'm going to talk about the tempest launcher a great deal elsewhere so I will say here that I think if you're taking the Tempest Launcher, the what Exarch power you want to choose. So the standard Exarch power allows your Dark Reaper Exarch to reroll ones to hit, which is really good, right? I mean, especially with especially with the Tempest Launcher, high volume of fire. Uh, but there there is in Psychic Awakening, you can swap. There are two Exarch powers worth considering. And one of them, it allows you to, it gives you a free reroll when you generate shots for the Tempest Launcher. So uh, obviously, if you're coming up against a horde unit, this doesn't help you, right? If, if there are more than 10 models in the enemy unit, you're just going to get 12 shots anyway. But if you actually have to roll the dice, uh, having a reroll is great because, you know, if you have the Tempest Launcher and you roll 
a three, it's kind of a bummer to blow your command reroll on the Tempest Launcher, especially if you have multiple Tempest Launchers. And there might be some other command reroll in the shooting phase that you really want. You probably don't want to have to burn it on your Tempest Launcher. So you might want to swap out the ability to reroll ones to hit with uh, the ability to reroll the number of shots for the Tempest Launcher. That really might be worth doing. I, I, I've often done this. The other thing you can do is for one CP, he can have both. And that can be very powerful because obviously the rerolling ones to hit uh, is, it more, is more likely to come up the greater the volume of fire. And if you're rerolling for the Tempest Launcher, well, you're probably firing a lot of shots. But I also think it's fine to just go with, to you know try to trust to the law of averages. The average roll on 2d6 is a seven and being able to reroll ones to hit with the XR could be really good, especially if you're not planning to have a nearby Autark. You just sort of have to think about what else is in your list, what synergies exist, and the types of units you want your Reapers to eliminate. If you have another way to deal with light infantry, probably you leave the Tempest Launcher at home and you, and you go with an extra Reaper Launcher. Okay, so at this point, I have already, we, we've talked about all the all of the possible weapons loadouts for the Exarch, and I've already hit on the two Psychic Awakening powers that are worth considering. One being Rapid Shot, which gives you that extra shot with the Reaper Launcher or the Tempest Launcher, but why would you do that? Uh, and then, of course, the other one is Reign of Death, which is, is the reroll. There, there are four other ones. I'm not going to talk about them. They're bad. I'll, I'll briefly talk about Focused Fire and why it's uh, probably not worth taking. So the Focused Fire is, is the last option, and it looks initially tempting. It allows the, Reacher, the, the Dark Reaper Exarch to target a character unit, even if it's not the closest enemy. So it ignores uh, Lookout Sir. And initially, that looks amazing because... Uh, they're right, like flat three damage. There are pretty good characters in the game that potentially you could just pop with that. And and if you roll, if you were to run a few Dark Reaper Exarchs, right, you could, you could, wow, could you do some effective character assassination? The problem is it only works within eighteen inches, and the only hope for keeping your Dark Reapers alive, really, is to keep them far away from your opponent. The last thing you want is for your Dark Reapers to be within 18 inches of not only enemy units, but an important enemy character, which probably means you're even closer to uh, to other enemy units, right? If they're insulating that character with Lookout Sir. So it's just, it's really, it's not good. And they're too expensive to be a trading unit, right? You, you don't want to run a Wave Serpent up the board, have three MSU units of Dark Reapers pop out of it so that they can be like, make that Jawa noise from, you know, episode four. Who's da Right? And like, Get him. No, it's a bad idea, kids, because uh, that's like 500 points. And there's no, there's no character in the game that's worth trading. Uh, you might be thinking, Brent, that's only that's only 300. Well, if you add in the cost of the Wave Serpent, it's, su it's super expensive. Uh, it, it's just not worth it. Okay, so we have two possible Exarch powers, and whether in which one you take really depends on whether or not you're taking the Tempest Launcher. And if you take the Tempest Launcher, you're choosing between Reign of Death or just the default rerolling ones to hit. Otherwise, you really are. I mean, Rapid Shot is just obviously better than rerolling ones to hit. Okay. So, uh, the big if you're going to run Reapers after, you know, I guess deciding whether you're going to take a Tempest Launcher, the, the job you're, you're going to have them do, let's, let's assume that what you're doing with your Reapers is using them as a counter to enemy hard targets and in, in particular... Bikes, infantry, that sort of thing, uh, but they're also they're also good at eliminating tanks and monsters. Now you have to decide whether or not you want to run several MSU squads, three elf squads, or whether you want to run one large-ish squad. Uh, and we will we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages to each of those. So the one that's been doing really well in in tournaments, I've already said this, is that MSU build. And if you look here on the screen, you will see uh, the MSU build. And what I've done with my Reaper, so I have, um, as, as you've already seen, I have I have three fully painted squads of Dark Reapers in, in my collection, uh, two sort of traditional dark color schemes, and I did them in a way that they could easily be distinguished from one another, but they look enough 
They look similar enough that I can also run them as a, as, as a squad. Uh, if you have built, if you have multiple Reaper squads and you've built your Exarchs with the Tempest Launcher, uh, another option is to vary the paint scheme a little bit and swap in a, a differently colored uh, Reaper model and count that with, with just a regular Reaper Launcher and count that as the Exarch. That's what I've done. These, um, and full disclosure, the, the the white the white reapers which I think look super cool uh, and I use in my MSU reaper units as as exarchs I did not paint those uh, pretty much all the craft world model most of the craft world models that you see on my channel or or on my blog I, I painted there are a few exceptions here and there my well my wife painted the wraith seers uh, but these these white reapers I picked up on a craft world's Facebook group when I think shortly after psychic awakening came out. So that I could do the MSU build more easily, and and they look they look better than mine. There's no there's no no doubt about it. Pretty cool. Anyway, uh, this MSU build that you're looking at, three units of three Dark Reapers with an Exarch, with a Reaper launcher, with Rapid Shot, is so good because if you're running them with Expert Crafters and it, it, it's helpful to run. You don't need to run them with uh, Master Shots, but you can. But if you're running them with Expert Crafters and they have Rapid Shot, each of these units, each three-man Reaper unit, when they're, when they're doing the flat three damage profile, is putting out almost... Uh, well, they're putting out 60%, 66% more firepower than, than they would have before. I was going to say almost double, but that isn't really true. It's really... It's two-thirds more. They're putting out two-thirds... So they're firing five shots. If... If you end up using all the rerolls, right? If you if you reroll a hit, which is not unlikely, and then you reroll a wound, you really are doubling. It really is like you were firing with six reapers in the pre-psychic awakening days, and that is just so powerful, right? So the MSU build, I I get my three shots plus one for rapid shot plus one reroll to hit, one reroll to wound. That really does add up to to double, and and that's that's amazing. That is an incredibly powerful tool. The disadvantage, I've, and I've already talked about uh, target priority and, and why it's such a powerful tool. The, uh, there's one other advantage to this. Over, so I'm, I'm, in a moment, I'll talk about the big block of Reapers. And also the fact that this is incremental fire is great. So if you have 10 Reapers together in a squad, you have to make a decision when the squad fires how you are going to divide the fire. So you have to make predictions about how many missiles it will take to eliminate a target. And if you've played any amount of 40K, you know just how fickle those sorts of predictions can be. You might be firing, let's say you're firing 11 shots. You've got a 10-man Reaper squad with rapid shot. You're firing 11 shots and you say, well, I probably only need eight of those to wipe out those five Terminators or whatever. Um, or, or, well, Terminators are a bad example because of transhuman physiognomy. Maybe there's a, there's a flyer that will take three hits to eliminate. And you're like, well, I will, so I'll put six into the flyer, and if I'm hitting on threes and wounding on threes, and maybe I can even reroll ones, I should be able to get it, and then these other shots are going to go into something else, but the flyer really needs to die. Well, it might turn out that then the flyer doesn't die. Um, but you don't want to just put everything into the flyer because then it's obviously overkill. So incremental fire. Having three groups of Reapers shooting means you get to, like, roll some dice, see if you killed the thing, and then try again. And the other advantage, obviously, to incremental fire with MSU Reapers is you, you're just totally capitalizing on rapid shot and also expert crafters. So if you, if you compare the fire output of three three-man Reaper units to one ten-man Reaper unit, um, you will find that it stacks up very favorably for the groups of three. Now, there's a way to offset that. When I talk about the 10-man unit, I'll talk about why. But if you're, if you're just running with expert crafters and rapid shot, uh, it's, it's obvious, right? You're adding, if you have three Reaper units, you're adding three flat three damage shots instead of one flat three threat damage shot compared to the 10 elf unit. And you're getting six rerolls instead of two rerolls for to wound and to hit. But then additionally, this, this is the advantage of incremental fire. You get to keep checking after you roll dice whether or not you eliminated the thing. And if you didn't, you can assign fire appropriately. And if you get really hot dice and you destroy something more easily, then you're not wasting additional missiles. So they're even better. The, the point here is that the, the fire output 
Not only does it favor the smaller squads when you consider the number of dice you're rolling, but it's even better than it initially appears to be statistically because it's easier to allocate your target elimination resources optimally. Okay. The disadvantage to these MSU Reaper squads is that it's very hard to keep them alive unless you play them very, very carefully, and sometimes not even then, because Reapers are toughness three. Yes, they have a three-up save, but if a motivated opponent can get around that, and they have one wound, they're, they're, just, they're very fragile. Uh, and the other issue, right, is normally you would keep, if you have a hard-hitting, somewhat fragile, heavy support unit, the normal move for craft worlds is to fire and fade it, right? So if you're running a large unit of Reapers, you could move it out into line of sight and you fire at something and then fire and fade it. You could even fire and fade it into a transport. Similarly, if you were running three war walkers in, in, a, in a squad, you could do the same thing. And, and they're tougher than Reapers significantly, but uh, you'd have access to that. But the, the three elf Reaper units can't. You could fire and fade one of them, right? So you, you've got to find a way to play around that uh, in order to make this a reliable investment of points, because at 32 points per model, these are these are very expensive. These are very expensive units, right? Even um, nine nine reapers and three man MSU. It's 300 points, so or a little bit less, a lot of points. Okay. Uh, now, if we compare this to the the max squad, right? The the, the 10 elves. Uh, obviously, the, the, the 10 elves have the advantage that it's easier to buff them, and they can, in fact, fire and fade into a transport or fire and fade out of line of sight. So in theory, it's just easier to keep the 10 elf squad alive. Yes, they don't hit quite as hard, but you might say, look, if I can guarantee that, or, or if I can count on probably using them over multiple turns, that's certainly way better than having nine reapers that all die on turn one, uh, or, or as soon as they move out to fire at something. And yes, if that's how it's shaking out, you're probably right. But there, there are ways to, to mitigate the fragility of the Reapers. And there are, there are reasons why the, the, the Ten Elf Squad has additional drawbacks. But, but first, we'll talk about how to mitigate the, uh, the differential in fire. So if you cast, if you have 10 Reapers and they have expert crafters, and maybe masterful shots. Although one of the, the nice things about Reapers too is you really don't need masterful shots. Like if, if you are running a single Craft Worlds detachment with say Hunters of Ancient Relics, which doesn't help your Reapers at all, right? That's the extra attacks on objectives. But if you're running a bunch of Shining Spears or maybe you even have some Wraith Blades in there as objective holders, that's an enormously powerful uh, sub-faction pick, right? Shining Spears want Expert Crafters and Hunters of Ancient Relics, and Reapers have fantastic synergy with Spears, which are probably our other best unit in the current meta. So let's assume you don't even have Masterful Shots. Maybe, maybe they're running in a detachment uh, where that's not available. But if you're running Expert Crafters and you have Rapid Shot, uh, you, your unit of 10 Reapers with the Exarch firing an extra shot is putting out 11 dice when we're using the flat three damage and we're rerolling one roll to hit and one roll to wound. Well, if you cast Guide on them and you have, uh, or, or you have a nearby Autark and you cast Fateful Divergence, well, now, if it's Guide, they're rerolling all of their hit rolls. And if it's faith, Faithful Divergence, along with Expert Crafters, you can now roll reroll two wound rolls. Well, your, your nine elves using... Uh, rapid shot and expert crafters they only have three rerolls to wound so your your 10 elves now have two rerolls to wound and so it, with those buffs with faithful divergence faithful divergence excuse me it's a runes of fortune power that replaces smite you give it to a warlock uh you've got two wound rerolls and you're either rerolling all your ones for the alt arc you're rerolling and, and one two for expert crafters or you're just rerolling everything for guide now it, it really it gets you there it ends up being if you do the math, it ends up being reasonably comparable. You can also, if you have a nearby Farseer, uh, you can pop the stratagem Runes of Witnessing. I, I think the most efficient way to get there, honestly, uh, it does cost a bunch of CP. To, Runes of Witnessing is a 2 CP stratagem. I've mentioned it before on the channel. It allows you to reroll ones to wound for units within six inches 
of the Farseer. And so this is uh, this can be great, right? An Autark and a Farseer near your Dark Reapers. Well, if they reroll, if they have expert crafters, they reroll all their ones to hit and one two, and then they reroll all their ones to wound and one two for crafters, and that will be comparable to the the MSU units that have more shots and more rerolls. Now, of course, the trade-off here is your MSU Reapers don't require psychic resources or some HQ to be standing near them or for you to burn command points uh, in, in order to give them rerolls. So th there are additional resources that go into making that larger unit of Reapers comparable in damage output. And even then, it's not incremental damage. So it's still, it's, it's good, it's scary for an opponent, but it's still not quite equivalent to the MSU Reapers. It's also very expensive because if, if you are firing that larger unit of Reapers, if you're just firing fading them out of line of sight, they're still vulnerable to indirect fire or very fast maneuverable units. Uh, so the, the solution then maybe is to, to fire and fade them into a transport and at that point, your, your investment is just insane because you've got almost 300 points into the Reapers. Then you need a Wave Serpent. The cheapest Wave Serpent is 150 points. So it's gotten a bit cheaper since the, the points update. But nevertheless, you, you, it, that's 25% that's of your army, pretty much. Uh, that's a lot. So it's it, not necessarily the case that you shouldn't do it, but it is a big investment. The easier move, right, I think rather than running the big unit of uh, Reapers and then trying to find ways to capitalize on their survivability by having them fire and fade into a transport slash buff them and spend all of these command points, I think the easier move is to run the three MSU Reaper units, but get creative about how you keep them alive. And the way to be creative about keeping them alive has to do with knowing what your opponent is bringing to the table and then thinking about uh, turn one positioning. So look at it like this. You definitely, the, the question number one is, will I start them on the board? Because in ninth edition, even if a unit, even if you're playing a faction that doesn't have webway strike or you're using webway strike for some other craft world models, anybody, anybody can hold units back by putting them into reserve and then bringing them on as reinforcements. And it has to do with the power level of the unit. So for two CP, you could, in fact, if you have three MSU Reaper units, for two CP, you could start them in reserve. And the, the whether or not you do this is going to depend on what your opponent has in her army. If your opponent shows up to the table with a bunch of indirect fire, and currently there's not a ton of that in the game. And what there is, we have craft worlds usually, and you're probably not coming up a lot against a lot of other craft worlds players. So that might not even come up. The meta may change, and there might be a ton of indirect fire, and then and that will change things. But if your opponent does have some whirlwinds or some sort of powerful long range indirect fire, range matters too. Check the range of their indirect fire because if it's 24 inches, you're fine. Uh, but if your opponent has something with, say, 48-inch range indirect fire, and there's just no way for you to hide your Reapers on turn one and have them be safe, then you want to start those three MSU units in reserve. Your other option, or, or the other threat, excuse me, is incredibly maneuverable, fast units. So if your opponent has flyers that can just be in your deployment zone and get a beat on anything turn one, uh, then again, you don't want to gamble your Reapers on getting first turn you start them in reserve, and this this can feel this can feel rough, right? Because it's a big investment. You really want your long range heavy fire support on turn one, and if you start them in, in reserve, you're not going to have it. But I will say that against a lot of opponents, you can't see a lot on if you do get first turn, right? You can't see a whole lot anyway uh, to target, and so. It's probably not. It's probably not a terrible loss if you do have to start them in reserve and, and bring them on turn two, and then obviously you probably bring them on in the in, on in the back of your deployment zone, uh, and then at that point you'll be playing them the same way you would is if you weren't bringing them in from reserves, and and that's what I'm going to talk about now. So if you're just deploying your reapers on the table, 
You want them in your deployment zone and you want them towards the back of your deployment zone because your Reaper's best tool for staying alive is range. Those Reaper launchers have a 48 inch range. They can outrange your opponent pretty effectively. And so you want to stay as far away as possible, ideally, so, so you, can, you can target the units you need to target, but they will struggle to target you. Uh, I like to, to put my Reapers on usually the, in the corners of my deployment zone, and you look for places where you can make really narrow avenues of fire where you're going to be able to target a unit that's a good target for your Reapers, but there won't be your, your opponent is going to struggle to maneuver units into position to, to create a firing avenue on those Reapers uh, in order to return fire and eliminate the squad. So ideally, I'll, I'll show you on the screen now. Here's, here's, a, here's a, po a possible deployment scenario. I have not deployed a, a, a full army, but there are a couple of units of Reapers tucked away in my backfield, completely out of line of sight of the opponent. And I'm gonna look at how my opponent moves on turn one, and I'm gonna try to use these lanes of fire between the buildings, uh, hug the building with the Reapers, just to keep that unit obscured from most of my opponent's army and do some real damage. And I ideally also stay out of range of, of the most dangerous weapons, right? There's certain, it, the, the armor characteristic on your Reapers is, is such that they can, especially if they have some light cover or maybe if you're using Masters of Concealment or something, they, they can shrug off uh, some small arms fire reasonably well. If you, if necessary, you can pop lightning fast reactions to make them minus one to hit. I don't love doing that because it, it it's three reapers and is that it's, it's craft worlds are a CP hungry army, uh, and so spending two CP to make three models minus one to hit is often not a great move. But there are, certainly there are going to be very specific circumstances in which it might make sense, but. Outranging your opponent using carefully considered firing lanes, uh, you can fire and fade one unit that, that really wants to target something that means making those uh, Reapers vulnerable. But then here's, here's the other thing, right? The, the way you keep these models alive is to have tactical synergy with other units in your army. So in order to eliminate your Reapers, your opponent needs to get in into with in, into range of your reapers right and to have an angle of fire so if for example you're running a bunch of shining spears you can make it incredibly undesirable for your opponent to maneuver uh a unit into threat range right because th that involves being within charge distance of your shining spears or if you're maybe you're running harlequins also Right, that's a very popular thing right now. If you if you're playing, if you want to do some competitive craft worlds play at very high levels, you bring some harlequins also, and it, it feels it, it still feels more craft worlds than teaming up with Drakari, right? Like that's there are weird, creepy murder cousins who that that I don't know thematically. But if you go all the way back to Second Ed, right? Craft uh, harlequins were not their own their own army; they were. Um, craft worlds could take up to one Harlequins unit, so it, it always feels when when I take Harlequins, I always I, I don't I don't feel like I'm really cheating on craft worlds in the same way as if I if I team up with Drakari. We're not going to talk about Yunari right now. They're uh, they they need some love. Uh, so anyway, if you have good tactical synergy with aggressive, fast, hard hitting dangerous, points efficient units in your army, you can disincentivize your opponent from getting into range of those Reapers. She can still choose to do that, but then probably if your Reapers moved into position and eliminated something juicy, and then your opponent uh, eliminates your 96 point Reaper squad, and then you eliminate their elimination unit with your Shining Spears, it's it's a chess game and potentially you're, you're winning you're winning the trade there, hopefully. It could be a two for one. They're tricky to use, right? There's there's no way around the fact that uh, this this isn't easy and keeping them alive is the hardest aspect of playing Reapers. But again, I think if you outrange your opponent, you push your opponent back with other high threat units, you create firing lanes very carefully, and you with with highly intentional use of fire and fade and maybe occasionally lightning fast, uh, you can keep Reapers in most matchups alive for 
multiple turns and have them really do some work for you. So that's also worth considering. Uh, lastly, even these MSU builds do benefit from certain sorts of buffs. Uh, if you have a, a warlock who maybe um, can't, you, you maybe you have protect smite or protect. Uh, excuse me. Maybe you have protect jinx twice in your list. You've already protected something, and nothing's in range for jinx. Uh, even a three elf unit of reapers that already has expert crafters. That's a great target for fateful divergence, which lets you reroll either one hit die or one wound roll. Uh, obviously, if there's a if if you have a nearby autark and you have multiple three man or three elf, excuse me, uh, they could be they elves or she elves. Uh, three elves, three. if you have multiple three elf units near an autark, that's a super powerful damage multiplier. Casting doom on particularly tough targets, that's a super powerful damage multiplier. With judicious use of jinx and doom uh, and maybe an autark or even runes of witnessing again, there's very little in the game that these MSU reaper units cannot threaten in a big way so i think that's about it uh the 10 elf reaper squad is powerful it can fire and fade into a vehicle it can fire and fade out of line of sight it doesn't have quite the same damage output and in order to have similar damage output it needs a lot more buffs the smaller units are a little bit harder to keep alive but they they do hit significantly harder without needing love and support and both are incredibly well suited to the current meta really powerful really good and they all have great synergy with some of our other strongest units and also the sub faction bonuses that you want to be taking anyway which makes them a great pick now if i were to leave it here somebody in the comments section would say but brent what about putting six reapers into a falcon is that a good idea uh yeah sure i here i i'm a little i don't i don't love it for the the simple reason that and, and it's a little bit hypocritical of me i was thinking it before making the video i was thinking trying to work out like why can i stomach 10 in the wave serpent but i have a tough time with six in the falcon uh it, if you leave the falcon if you want the falcon to be able to use its weapons and participate as a heavy support unit in the firefight then when the reap when the six reapers fire and fade into it it still has to be within line of sight of the enemy and maybe there's a way to set that up so even if the falcon is destroyed when they jump out of the falcon they can be out of line of sight if you can do that maybe it's worth doing but i think what you end up doing is incentivizing blowing up the falcon uh at which point the reapers may just be out in the open you may lose one in the explosion and 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 then the other option is just to keep it totally out of line of sight and you have six reapers firing fate and it's it's kind of fine i guess but i think six reapers as a single squad of six don't have the same degree of they don't have the incremental fire that the threes have nor do they have as many shots for expert crafters and rapid shot uh nor do they benefit as much from the they're just in this like weird in-between space where i think it's difficult to get the same performance out of them that you can get out of either of those other builds and yeah they're a lot cheaper the falcon's a little bit cheaper than the wave serpent it brings some heavy support fire which maybe mitigates not having as many reapers it, it might not be a bad idea um i probably have an irrational my, my, my sense that this is just not as strong a build might not be totally fair and rational but i i sense that it is not as strong as not as strong a build uh for the reasons that i have stated right and if if you want the falcon to participate they're exposed and then if it doesn't participate that's just an awful lot of points to to have invested in a unit that then maybe doesn't have reliable enough target elimination for the sorts of targets that it wants relative to its own point value i think that just the the proportional payoff and target elimination to points invested is better at at the, the other two in, in the other two builds that we've discussed. That said, it's still good if you want to put six in a falcon and tell me how great it is in the comments below. Uh, 
please do. So that's it. Dark Reapers. Hopefully this, uh, hopefully this has been useful, even to those of you who are already Reaper lovers and experts. Uh, oh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Phoenix Lord. Excuse me. Yeah, when I do these videos for... I knew there was one more thing. When I do videos for Aspect Warriors that have Phoenix Lords, I am going to make a point of addressing whether or not it makes any sense at all to run those Aspect Warriors with their, with their Phoenix Lord. So let's talk about... Morgan Ra a little bit. And and I remember there was at back in eighth edition there was a little bit of chatter that maybe Morgan Ra was the only Phoenix Lord other than Asserman who is actually worth considering. And his deal is that he is the Phoenix Lord. So he has that he he hits on twos, right? Like like they all do. And he has that two up save, uh, like they all do, but uh is hard up for an invuln save, which is unfortunately typical, uh, with the exception of Asserman. And he carries this like artifact shuriken cannon thing, uh, which is a little bit like the screamer shuriken cannon carried by Death Jesters for, for Harlequins. Uh, it has a 36-inch range shrieker profile, which is assault one, strength six, minus one AP, one damage. And if you kill at least one infantry model, the unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. And then it has a 36 inch range assault four profile, where it's just strength six minus one AP, one damage. And it's okay in melee. But your Morgan Ross should never be getting into melee because if he's running around with your Dark Reapers, then that's, you know, hopefully they're never getting into into melee. Um, your Reapers always sit on a three plus, he always sits on a two plus, and his weapon can shoot twice each turn. So in theory, right, if you're doing the Assault 4 version of it, now it's Assault 8. Uh, that's pretty good, you know. It's like a little bit better than two scatter lasers because it has a minus 1 AP and they have nothing. And it hits on twos instead of threes. Um, I don't think it's worth it for the points, to be honest. I, I think you're better off investing in an Autark for fewer points and buffing your, reaper, your, your, your Reapers that way. And in terms of any sort of like close combat support he could provide, well, if you have an Autark with a Power Sword and a Fusion Pistol, it's, it's, a, sim it's a similar level of, of melee support. Uh, he, he lets Dark Reapers within six inches reroll ones, but Autarchs do that too for fewer points. He's not bad, but I, I, I really think he doesn't make the grade I, for competitive play. Um, also, it's just awkward that he has a 36-inch range, right? And they have a 48-inch range. So, And I think that this is ultimately, even if I'm running a slightly more casual competitive list, where he loses me is you're trying to keep your Reapers alive by outranging your opponent with the 48 inch range and he can't shoot if you are the exactly the range from your opponent that you want your reapers to be and so i just i think he's not i want the phoenix lords to be good i really do i i love the i love the lore i particularly love the gav thorpe novels uh about asserman and jane czar um but we're not there yet i think we need the asserman's pretty good but we i think we, we we need to wait for the codex before we start running our dark reapers around with um our skull faced phoenix daddy okay that's really it this time uh if you like this video please click like if you want to see me make more videos please tell me in the comments below or um if you have other thoughts on how to play dark reapers please leave those and if you have particular preferences for what video you'd like to see next go ahead and tell me that too. Thanks guys. That's it. We'll see you next time.